Boardroom, boardroom bound. bound episode episode 48. 47. How to next gen leaders it take make to lead them to the boardroom with Bob with Paul Smith. Fast forward a few more years, and I, I saw the impact that not just myself but other young people uh, were having on boards, uh, bringing new ideas, new perspectives into boards, whether they were uh, well developed or not. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give new and aspiring directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, we're speaking with Paul Smith, who is the founder of the Future Director Institute. FDI is an international training company and community that works exclusively with next generation leaders, helping to transform them into boardroom influencers. Paul is also the author of the book, Right Seat, Right Table, which is a guide to finding and securing the ideal board role. And he also hosts the podcast, Boardroom Hustle. Lots of synergies between what we're doing here and what he's doing there. The goal is basically the same thing that we're doing, helping new and aspiring directors to bring their best self to the boardroom. We've got a lot of information that Paul is going to bring together and share the journey that they take people on and including some of the shocking results that they have seen that are holding people back from getting to that board role. I'm very excited to bring this episode to you today and I know you're going to take a lot from it. Let's jump into the show. Paul Smith, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, this is a a wonderful confluence of events because in many ways we have similar conversations in our world. We are on opposite sides of the world, but uh, we do a lot of similar stuff. We both do a podcast about the boardroom. Yours is the Boardroom Hustle. You have the Future Directors Institute that you lead where you are preparing the next generation of board directors. So there's so much to dig into. You've got your new book that we should be talking about. So lots of ground to cover today, but maybe we can just start with how you got to where you are today that you're you're training and preparing people up to become and be empowered to be a board director uh thanks that's a, that's a great question and i'll try and keep it brief because it's a relatively long story with many multiple streams um and one thing you'll learn about me i love telling a good story um <laughs> so i started my board career in my early 30s uh and almost by accident uh so i thought um and i sort of fell into a role because i was invited to join a non-profit um and i had no had no previous exposure at a non-executive level but i had worked with boards before that um so that sort of like was my first exposure to the boardroom and as on as a non-executive director um and the journey that i went through was very interesting and i wanted to see if it was normal or irregular and i went round and spoke to a lot of other people my age and who also started out at a younger age and maybe be doing for a while and found that my journey was pretty standard. And what I didn't do was my due diligence. Uh, what I assumed was, even though I was the youngest by 10 to 15 years, um, I was, uh, I assumed that everybody else around me um, knew what they were doing. And I realized very <laughs> soon on that they, di- they didn't know exactly what they were doing. <laughs> It's hard and to so know what, what I want due diligence should look like if you've never had experience before. <laughs> well, exactly. And again, there was no there was no assistance coming from the board in that respect either. And again, even though they look great on paper, um, they they didn't really have any good governance structures. What I thought were good governance structures without any training, just what I call common sense in this respect. So um, from that, basically, it led to the idea that A, well, first of all, sorry, I should go back again. Nine months later, I was chair of that board. Uh, Still my first board role, and I was chair of the board just because I was was just leading it in what I thought was a natural way, um, which was to basically facilitate the group, get the best out of the group, and trying to bring in some professional governance standards. Um, and, and from that, I was still understanding of the role of the director and the role of the board. Fast forward a few more years, and I, I saw the impact that not just myself, but other young people 
uh, were having on boards, uh, bringing new ideas, new perspectives into boards, whether they were uh, well developed or not. Um, and so I wanted to help more people do that. Um, so the idea for Future Directors Institute first came about as just a sort of almost like a support group of young directors, mm -hmm. and it's uh, turned into a, a, a education training community, which is what it is now. And it's been going successful for several years, and I imagine has just multiplied, so has grown to be Australia and New Zealand. I know you're over here in North America as well, so I imagine it's just resonating with your target audience. Uh, yes, it has uh, really resonated with the audience. But interestingly, for the people we're working with, um, and like any other person coming into the boardroom, especially as a non-executive, the biggest barriers to entry, you would think uh, a lack of experience, a lack of knowledge. It's actually time and themselves, their own confidence. So the people we tend to work with, whilst they're responding really well, they're basically saying, a lot of them are going, well, I want to do this, but not right now because I am concentrating on my other parts of my life. So their executive career, management career, wherever they happen to be, whatever stage they happen to be in their job or they run their own business, um, or, and they may be having a family at this age as well. You know, the people we tend to working with are sort of under the age of 40. Mm -hmm. That may seem to someone who's in their late 30s, they might think, well, I'm not young, but in the board <laughs> context, you are. Right. Um, you know, board, PwC defined board young as under 50. Right. So uh, someone who's 43 like myself, I'm still board young and I've been doing it for about 10 years. Um, but we tend to, we work with people in their 20s and 30s and sort of early 40s and they're all still young. But obviously at that point of their career, they're all sort of like accelerating or peaking, depending on you look at it. And obviously having families as well, if they're that way inclined. Um, and so there's lots of competing priorities. So time is a big issue. So we're still quite niche in that respect because it's not for everybody. We're not expecting every single person to come through. Um, and also the board role, board roles and those sort of leadership roles are not for everybody. So it keeps us pretty nimble and pretty light and pretty boutique. And that's why we've been spreading geographically. But the biggest barrier for most people is themselves, their own confidence that they actually belong in the boardroom. And that's what we're trying to help help show them as well, that they can belong in the boardroom. And clearly it benefits boards at large if we take the 30,000 foot view to have more, I'm gonna call it diversity of thought. And that is a whole sorts of range. Obviously there's gender, there's nationality, economic status, um, international perspectives, but age is another big one. I'm the same as you. I was in my late twenties, put on my first board and it was basically pale, male and stale. And I was just wildly different <laughs> from everybody else. So I imagine part of the conversation with the groups you're targeting is the first thing you have to get them over is why would you want to join a board, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, that is the first conversation. You know, why why would you want to be there in the first place? And again, most of them, this is the great thing I love about working with the next generation. You know, I like to call generation change um, <laughs> rather than Gen Y, Gen X. I'm a, I'm a young Gen X, but I have millennial tendencies if you look at the stereotype, but also <laughs> a little bit of baby boomer in me as well, I suppose. But I tend to think about generation change. And it's not, again, it's not everybody within this sort of age group. It's a certain type of person who is up for making things better, change, making an impact, have making a difference. And these are the sort of... Um, uh, these are sort of motivators that are seen and wanting to get into leadership positions earlier. And it's not a case of, okay, I've got to wait my turn and work my way up. It's like, I've got value to offer now. I know it's not exactly the same value as somebody else who has been doing something for 20, 30 years more, but I've got a very different perspective. And you mentioned um, what we call cognitive diversity and that's really what you're looking for in the boardroom. You're looking for people who can bring in different perspectives, contrarian, devil's advocate, look at it from a different angle, come from a digital or a marketing or a compliance or a numbers or a people management, cultural perspective, and look at these strategic risk and financial issues from different angles. And we tend to say that the best way to Sort of artificially create that is through generational gender cultural international socio-economic um uh, labels i suppose you could say and that's the easy way but i always say there's nothing wrong with a group of old white men if they bring cognitive diversity it's just highly unlikely 
Um, I, think that, I think that's fair. <laughs> but the other part for me is I also think it matters who your target customer is. And if you are yes. targeting old white men as your business, well, then you might be missing some innovation ideas. But okay, that looks probably about right in a photo. But if you're targeting 20 year olds because you're selling <laughs> whatever it is, and it's a pale male stale board, that would look pretty weird in the annual report. It would. And look, that's the biggest change. You know, does your board reflect your community, whatever happens to be your employees, your customers? And look, there's something to be said about it's not always going to be fully reflective. Um, even if you are, what if you're targeting, what if your customers are children? Does that say you have to have children on your board? So maybe, and maybe at least you should have an advisory group made up of children. Hmm. Um, but you, and again, at the board level, boards would, may, may say, well, we have, we might have that from a customer testing perspective through management. Well, the thing is though, if, if ideas are being brought from management to the board for the board to stress test and guide and direct, then how can they have any empathy or judgment on that when they have no exposure or that at least any independent advice? Some big stuff that's coming out of Australia. Um, we've had a Royal Commission, which is basically a government funded investigation into wrongdoing within the financial services sector. And they found the boards weren't taking independent advice, uh, legal or otherwise. They were relying on in-house counsel. They were relying, overly reliant on management because they didn't have the skills themselves to do this. So even if a board doesn't have the skills and you obviously have a finite board and finite skills, you should even should always have independent uh, view coming in. And that's what the board's supposed to do. Um, even it's like a, not an independent board. You still want it to be having this proper oversight, not being over reliant on what's going on. And again, diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, diversity of experience, diversity of skills, that's what that's supposed to bring. Um, so I, I love the idea that we want uh, diversity of thought in all different ways and different formats and rights. But if we compare this to the historical view of boards, so especially if we go back in America, say 20 years ago, it was uh, your buddies from the country club, that's who you put on the board. But generally, they were either sitting CEOs, maybe a CFO or certainly retired. And you had to be in that club to be in the next club. And that's how it worked. And there's a perspective now, no, we want different types of people to give a different feedback and guidance, which is great. And I I guess the one challenge, and maybe this comes to the confidence part that you're talking how people understand, is that they think, but if I haven't been there and done it, if I haven't sat perhaps in the C-suite yet, how will I know the perspective bring and the value to add? How do you work through that? Is that more than just a confidence issue? Yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> it's There's so many issues uh, you're, that you're bringing up, and that's another barrier. Uh, Boards, I, I must say that boards are evolving away, evol a lot of boards, but not all boards are evolving away. This like, you know, jobs for the boys, you know, tap your mate on the shoulder, mm -hmm. come and join me type of thing. And also you have to be from a C-suite position to be invited on the board. But that it's still, if you think about the top end of town in terms of big com publicly listed companies, it's still very much like that. Because if you think about the currency of the boardroom, it's trust. And so the people in the boardroom don't trust people who haven't been there and done that. Mm -hmm. They also don't trust people they don't know. And that's why it's been there because human beings, you know, we like to put ourselves into tribes from a safety perspective. You know, we, we are risk averse, averse generally as a species. That's why, you know, we could go, that, we could go down to a topic of why we have accents and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, the right sort of side of things, but let's not get carried away. But essentially, well, at the moment, you know, we are two why, people divided by a common language, right? <laughs> we are, exactly. But, it, but essentially, um, our tribe is governance. So, um, uh, you know, that's why boards have been recruited like that. And so we help the next generation understand that in many places, that's what they're having to break into. So if, if trust is the currency that they've got to break into uh, or break through, then how can they actually create credibility and trust from within that group? And that comes through the actions you're taking, the conversations you're having, the network you're also developing. Like personally, I don't like the way that most boards are recruited in terms of you know, the, the, the root of this resistance, which is, you know, hi, Alex, I know you come and join our board because I know you, I trust you, you probably do a good job, but you, you're not probably going to kick up a fuss. Um, <clears throat> that's why the most boards are recruited because most boards don't have resources to hire, you know, uh, recruitment companies or to put, you know, paid ads out there and the time to, to filter hundreds of applications. 
However, so we have to teach people how to work within that system, which is to find yourself in the right place at the right time with the right credibility, with the right community around you who are basically mentoring and sponsoring you into those roles. And that means you have to build trust within that network. And then once you've built that trust within that network, and you may already, and the whole point of the people we're working with, they've probably already built a lot of that trust already. Then you then have a level of trust uh, with the potential board that you join, even if there's a second degree of connection there. Does that make sense? It does. And we know in America, it's uh, something around two thirds of boards are filled by personal networks. And I would yeah. ask you, I would argue that there's an additional point to it as well. I agree with your first points. I think the other one is if a board's only going to meet, you know, a few times a year and they've got a lot of stuff they got to get done. You don't want to get it wrong. You want to make sure that someone that you can vouch for because it's your reputation's on the line and you know they're going to be effective when you get in there. So I think that just reinforces the point that you really need to get into those networks and probably spending your time with the right networks that you're building, right? Is that part of coaching? It's not just anybody who could be on any board because you have to figure out yeah. which boards are the right ones for you, right? Uh, that's right. And the, going back to the reasons people want to be in the board, the other thing we focus on is helping to focus where they want to be. And, and um, it's not about their skills, but about their interests, their passions, their motivations in terms of where they believe they could add the most value. And that's what it is. Being on the board is about adding value, being in service and you know making an impact, regardless of whether it's a paid role or a voluntary role. So what we want you to do is focus in on what you want. Now, some people want to basically... They work, say, in the healthcare sector, and they want to join a healthcare board because it's an extension of their career. Others may work in a big bank, and they want to go and join a charity working in animal welfare. And it's completely different, but the skills are transferable, or the leadership is transferable. And really, we want to help people focus in on what is their passion, because at the end of the day, whether it's paid or voluntary, it's a huge commitment, and you want to do something you care about. And the easiest way to do something you care about is to follow your passions, follow for your interests, um, and then hopefully land it within a group of great people with a great board culture. Because, you know, again, for the people we're working with, we're not talking about professional board directors here. We're talking about people who are doing their board roles on the side of. It's like a side hustle, you could say, to a certain degree. Um, Hence your podcast name. Yeah, <laughs> hence my podcast name. Thank you. Um, you're one of the very few people who get that. Um, <laughs> um, but essentially, so so they're, they're carving out a part of their personal time and work time because obviously board meetings often happen during work for these people um, and they have very, very good employers um, or themselves. And so it has to be something they care about. There's no point just doing this for the sake of doing it. Um, and that's where we focus with and those are the types of people we work with, the ones who are doing it to be in service to something they care about, whatever that happens to be. And they use, tend to be change agents, as it were. And I don't think I could echo that enough. And I would take it from a slightly different tack of... Uh, and we talked a bit about this before, and I'm sure we'll come back to it, of learning due diligence for your first board role because you probably got it and just jumped in and did it. And I would encourage everybody, if you're thinking about, this is a path I want to go down. How do I get my first board role? Recognize you're going to look for a good board role, not the first board role, because then you'll be able to make a difference. And just as Paul said, you want something that you're passionate about because then I think you will actually bring your, your A game. You will do really well. You will add a lot of value to the organization, and that will help grow your network because all the people you're interacting with, not only the other board members, maybe the other group who are servicing the board, it could be lawyers, accountants, et cetera, they will see you, recognize that you are an outstanding board member, and that will sort of, it's almost like the, the snowball going downhill, picking up more snow. Is that how you see it? Bingo. Couldn't agree more. Okay. Well, then, then let's think about, there's obviously some challenges that are faced by new board directors in their journey. I would love if we could unpick a bit of that, because I'm sure that's some of the stuff that the group that you're working with is struggling with. Yeah, and it's interestingly, uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing now is um, we're continuing to do the work in terms of helping aspiring directors to become board directors. And now we're starting to work a lot more with those who are already on boards, whether they're part of our community or from outside. And they're basically, they're relatively new to the board and what are the challenges they're facing? Uh, now, we just co-authored a report um, with Diligent, the, the board software mm -hmm. company around, uh, and Spencer Stewart around onboarding new directors because Spencer Stewart are finding there's an increasing uptake of 
uh, new directors in the S&P 500 where it's their actual first board role and the importance of onboarding and orientation are quite there. And again, that's one of the key challenges for new directors is there's no orientation, there's no onboarding. You're just assumed that you can just hit the ground running. And therefore, you're sort of behind the the, the, eight, you know, the eight ball straight away. That's one of the key challenges is like, OK, what's going on? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I've just been lumped into the middle of a situation. I'm just assumed I'm going to get up. So, again, the way to overcome that challenge, if they don't have the board, doesn't have an onboarding or orientation process, is to actually create one, to do your due diligence. And part of your due diligence joining a board will be the orientation beforehand. Meet all your fellow board directors before the first board meeting. Arrange sessions with your chair uh, after the first two or three board meetings just to check in. If they are not doing this, then you, you can push it. You know, when you join a board, the first thing to understand is you're actually an equal partner. You know, you're, this is collective responsibility uh, with individual risk accountability as well but you're an equal partner maybe not politically but you are so you can actually say okay i need to help you need to help me get up to speed really quickly and that's one of the biggest challenges that young directors have or new directors have another one i think um they find again working with the type of people we're working with is time it goes back to the same thing beforehand is time um time to get prepared um people who know who know me and have done our programs will know that um the P word preparation is probably my favorite word to bandy around um, for people. You know, preparation, preparation, preparation. It's what it's all about. And whether you're trying to get a board role or you're on a board, the more prepared you are, the more influential you will become. And that's what it's all about for people. It's being out becoming influential. And that means preparation, not just by just reading your board papers, but researching your points of view, learning more. And that's preparation, learning new skills, learning new techniques, learning new knowledge, learning about your fellow board directors and being a, what I call a student of people and all that sort of side things. And this, that in itself will help you overcome a huge amount of the challenges in terms of when to speak up, when to listen, when's it my turn to talk? Um, <clears throat> what about my fellow directors? I've lumped myself into a, a culture where I don't like everybody, all these type of things these can all be overcome by preparation. And and that makes sense. And I would encourage people to think about it from that perspective as a job. You're not going to walk into a new job on the first day having not thought about it. There's going to be a lot of work you've done to prepare for the interviews. You want to make sure you're ready to hit the ground running. The board role is the same way, but almost magnified in the sense because it's higher profile. Maybe there's higher expectations of you. And we had Cheryl Batchelder on the show not too long ago, and she talked about her first board role, which was described to her by the recruitment firm as a starter board. And all of the board members recognized she was new, and they rallied around her and gave her the experience in the same way she talked about one of her boards recently where they decided to bring on two first-time directors and they had agreed as a board we need to make sure we get them up to speed quickly surround them with the right resources they made sure they were humble and they were ready to get feedback so that it was an intentional perspective but I agree with you we hear about so many organizations where the onboarding even at a fortune 100 company is not what you would think it might be no, and look, you know, it sounds like she was one of the lucky ones with a with a high performing board, and that's a that's a symptom of a high performing board because you want to get the best out of the people there. Um, you don't want them just to sit there like not contributing. You want them there. You hired them in the first place, so you want them contributing from day one as quickly as possible. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and that's what I love to see. But I think I think where this comes from is again going back to that traditional makeup of the board. Usually it's sort of retiring executives who have been there, done that. And there's a view that I already know everything I need to know. Mm. And now I'm giving and now I'm giving back of these skills to a company or an organization or an association, whatever it happens to be. And I think that's where we're changing and we're moving through this generational shift whereby you know enough to get yourself onto a board, but you don't know everything you need to know. The world is changing too quickly. Everything's updating constantly, you know all of our knowledge you, you go to university and you almost come out at the other end and everything you've learned is almost obsolete these days I was, I was a bit blah, so you get what, I, what i'm trying to say and i think it's the same way in the boardroom um one of the interesting bits of information i'd love to share is that um speaking anecdotally uh, uh having spoken to a lot of board consultants who do a lot of board evaluations and health checks one of the areas that boards rank themselves uh 
quite high in terms of they don't believe they need it is continuous education and learning. Um, they believe they already know most of what they need to know. And that for me is a big blind spot for boards. So when you tell me stories of somebody joining a board and they're like, they already have all this process to get them up to speed and they want to nurture them and make sure they get the both of them, that probably is a really good board that's learning and constantly evolving. But on the other side, you've got ones who just believe they already know everything they need to know. And I think that's the symptom of why some boards don't have onboarding processes because there's just this sort of, well, we knew everything, so you probably do too. <laughs> Well, that just reinforces the point. If you're bringing on what we might call some new blood, like some first timers onto it, who are going to ask different questions and come with a different perspective. It allows you as a board to step back and say, well, we thought we had that covered, but maybe not as much as maybe we thought we did. So we should spend some time and effort there. And it just shows you how important emotional intelligence is in the boardroom. You know, one of our program speakers, um, who's a very well, well, uh, well regarded and recognized uh, female board director in, in Australia, she said that, um, and again, it's been reinforced by other people's views these these days, but, you know, EQ is more important than IQ in the boardroom. And again, you know, part of EQ is that self-awareness, um, uh, as well as being able to see from different points of view, et cetera. But I love that part, that self-awareness part. And again, we just described that. Like if a board is self-aware, they're self-aware of their blind spots and their weaknesses and where they need to work on it. And that's a symptom of a high-performing board. And I know you're a big fan of Travis Bradbury's um, EI 2.0 book. Yes, yeah. I'm. A, I'm a. As I said, I'm a student of people. Uh, I, I do a lot of work with um, uh, neuroscience groups as well, trying to understand how humans tick. Because I'm all about. Um, and I, there's also another group here called Collective Mind. I'll give a shout out to them who do a lot of work around individual mental and emotional performance. And I'm tr I'm trying to weave their work into the boardroom because they essentially. You know, if we're, if we're walking to the boardroom, not um, operating at a high cognitive level, you know, the impact of our behavior and the decisions as a group is far, way, far, far, far more ranging, far more impactful than potentially in a smaller setting. So again, you want your directors, uh, regardless, to be performing at a high cognitive level. And so I'm, a, I, I'm trying to bring that stuff into the boardroom as much as I can. Well, which is great. And, and I imagine the book that you've got out called The Right Seat, Right Table is in some ways touches probably on everything we've been talking about today. I guess the summary is it's an outsider's guide to securing the ideal board role. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So um, the outsider's part, basically anybody's not on the inside, but generally it's for people who don't traditionally see themselves as board directors. So Again, we started out uh, looking at younger generations, but all the different labels, I suppose, visual labels you could um, put on people, anybody who's not a traditional board director. So the book is not really designed for the role for your pale male and stale. That's not my audience. Um, everybody else is in that respect. Um, and really the book comes in three parts. One is sort of why would you want to be in a boardroom? Why do we need this level of diversity and inclusion in the boardroom? And then it's the then it's the how to guide. How do you actually what do you need to do and how do you go about doing it? So it's a very practical, sort of process driven, what are the steps you need to go through? And the third part is like once you're in the board, it's almost like an introductory to book two of the of the trilogy, which I will be writing, uh, or I am writing, is um, okay, now you're in the boardroom, what behaviors uh, will make you effective and influential. Um, and, and that's really the third part is almost like an introductory to sort of finding your voice in the boardroom and being an influencer. Because when the, just, just so your listeners know, future directors, you know, that are name, it doesn't mean we're dealing with people who become directors in the future. Future directors is actually a definition. We've defined them in terms of the type of director they are. Um, and it's not because they're futuristic. Uh, in terms of, the, you know, their future focus, or that's part of it. It's actually about the type of person in terms of they're an influencer. They know how to get them the best out of themselves and the, and the people around them. Uh, and they're looking, always looking for new in ideas, new input. They're always learning. And that's how we define a future director. And that's what we're trying to create, a, a world of future directors, as it were. Um, and so the, the last part of the book is almost like an introductory to sort of like how, how do you get to that point? 
Paul, that is fantastic. And clearly, this is a book that uh, a lot of people would benefit from, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes. But that's not the only resource you make available. You've also got your podcast, right? And so that's The Boardroom Hustle. Maybe you can give us a little more context. How does that, does that match with the book? Does it pick up from where the book stops? Uh, no, there's no real matching. Like, uh, I love creating content and, uh, you know, I learn through conversation. Um, so I was having some amazing conversations with people. So I decided someone said, why don't you record them and create a podcast? And I went, well, that, that sounds like a good idea. So um, I started off just interviewing young board directors who we had helped or we'd worked with or we'd had on and the program as speakers uh, and just talking about their journey to the boardroom. And so the hustle was around the side hustle, but also them wanting to be agents of change. So, Paul, I know the, the, the podcast is going really well. You're already on to season two. So we will have links to the show notes so people will be able to listen to that. And we have covered so much in just a half an hour today. We've, we've blazed through it. And I'm sure the people who will want to be following up and understanding how do I learn from the great stuff you've got going on. You've got various uh, webinars and courses and information and the podcast and everything else. What is the best way for people to be in touch and follow? Well, I think if they're an aspiring director um, and, and they're just starting out or they're looking for their next board role, the way they visit, just come to our website, futuredirectors.com, and click on the button that says Director Diagnostic. Um, it's a free tool that basically we ask you 25 questions, uh, yes, no, maybe questions, essentially, and it would identify for you what your gaps and needs are in terms of your board journey across sort of like five categories, which we call um, uh, commitment, credibility, contribution, community, and confidence. And so that's a great step, first step for people to go, okay, this is where I'm at on my journey and this is where I need to concentrate on. And we it gives you a sort of a, a, a report off the back of that. And then if you want to do more, then you can dive deeper. But that's really the best place to go. And on, on top of that, um, I, would, I would definitely recommend my book for any aspiring director, again, any emerging director who's looking for more board roles. Um, because that's essentially what it's built for. Um, and I think that's that that would be the best place for people to start. Well, I've got it on my Kindle, and I've been enjoying reading it, so we will have a link to it in the show notes Thank for you. everybody else. And, uh, Paul, we were delighted to have you on the show today from all around the other side of the world. The, the Internet and technology makes it so easy these days. And thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be more boardroom-bound. Oh, thank you very much, and thanks for having me on the show. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Paul Smith. I love what the Future Director Institute is doing and preparing board members in, in similar ways that we are. But a big part of what he talks about is the confidence that they need to overcome, the idea that maybe now is the right time in my life. And that doesn't just mean confidence of can I do it, but it's also do I want to fit this in? Because it's got to be an intentional decision between your, your ascending career at the certain point in your life, but also probably your ascending family commitments and what those means. But also then thinking about if when you're committed to it, how do you find the right board wall? What's the right fit for you? How do you build the right network? How does all of that come together? Paul unpacked us very succinctly in today's show with some great anecdotes to boot. Now, remember, you can head over to podcast.gordon.edu where you can get links to all of today's resources. And maybe the most important thing I want you to take away from today is the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the high-quality content we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Now, thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be boardroom bound.